Ohio, Minnesota. Welcome back to the Tony Hernandez Show. I'm Tony Hernandez. Today is Saturday, March 30th. We got a great show. As you can see, we're in a new studio here. So for all our viewing audience, thank you for keep coming back. Our show is getting bigger and better because of you. Keep sharing it on your Facebook page. Keep watching us on YouTube and keep telling your friends about the Tony Hernandez Show. We have a big show today. We have the Minnesota State Republican chair candidates. Uh, we have Mr. Keith Downey. Uh, we pre-recorded a interview with Mr. Bon Clayton and later we're going to be talking to Mr. Donald Allen. We're going to be talking about their vision for the party. The election's coming up at State Central next week on Saturday. Uh, it's April 6th, so we'll be having a new Republican chair at that point. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to bring on the first guest, Mr. Keith Downey. Thank you for uh, yeah. coming on the show. Thanks for having me, Tony. It's yeah. great to be here. It's great for you to be here, too. Yeah. It's coming out uh, from a different area. You live in uh, over in the western uh, suburbs, I right? Do. Right, right, right. So good to be over here in the uh, northeast side. All right. So can you tell us a little bit, how's the campaign going so far, and what's the reception been, and, and are you going to win? Well, I'll leave that to the voters. Um, but, you know, what? the campaign has been a great experience. Um, for those who don't follow this kind of thing, you literally travel across the entire state of Minnesota, uh, visit with literally hundreds of people um, that are active participants in the Republican Party, and just getting around to the entire state, uh, getting reconnected with the good folks in Minnesota has been a wonderful experience. Great, great. Well, it's no secret that the Republican Party of Minnesota is in a bit of debt from uh, issues that occurred in the past. I believe the number is somewhere around 1.6 million. A lot of the activists, volunteers, and donors want to know how is that debt going to be paid off and do you have a plan if you're elected chair? Yeah, great question. Uh, so I think the debt is uh, maybe symptomatic of obviously some broader challenges that the Republicans have faced here uh, nationally and in Minnesota the last couple of years. And so, uh, yes, the debt is part of the challenge. But I think it's a, a deeper challenge that we have to address uh, in order to and before we can address the financial challenges. And that is restoring credibility uh, for the Republican Party, uh, not with the Repu or with the public only, but with our activists and the people who are engaged in Republican politics and run for office, uh, the people who contribute to our party and are, are part of the, uh, the mix that way, uh, we've got to let them know that the Republican Party is going to be managed effectively, that we're going to have the financial controls and we're going to have the discipline and we're going to operate in an excellent fashion. And I think if we convey to folks through the way we run the party after the new party chair comes in, in a way that restores that credibility and rebuilds that confidence, that gives us an ability uh, to go out and ask for people to invest in the future of the Republican Party. So I think first and foremost, it's rebuilding confidence. Mm -hmm. And it, not to go too much into the past, but you mentioned credibility. Why is there a, a why is the Republican brand lacking in credibility, and what can the chair do do about it specifically? Well, I think when you look at the Republican Party having you know a pile of debt, and we are the party that uh, advocates for fiscal responsibility and managing our budget in in the public arena, uh, for us to have incurred this debt without a way to pay for it, obviously that reflects poorly on us. And you know, after the election of 2012, there has been a lot of analysis, postmortems, autopsies, whatever you want to call them. And what I have told people, and I think what they're receptive to, is we have got to flip up the rearview mirror and we have got to look forward. And I think Republican activists, our candidates, uh, frankly, even I think the people of Minnesota are, are interested in a vital uh, GOP here in Minnesota. They think it's an important thing for us to have. And frankly, as a, a person who believes strongly in our Republican principles, I'm firmly convinced that we have got to reposition the Republican Party to lead in the state of Minnesota again. So, you know, I think you can come up with a dozen things, 20 things that caused us problems in the past. I think it's time for us to forget about that and think about what the winning uh, program is moving forward. And I went on to, to Facebook and Twitter and I asked people if they had any questions that they wanted to ask the, the candidates. Yeah. And, and one of the questions that came up from Karen Bauman, and she's, she watches this show week in and week out. Uh, she's a great activist from Woodbury. Uh, but she said that she had noticed that Republican leadership has, uh, in her opinion anyways, not supported uh, the candidates. In particular, I think she was talking about the 2012 uh, campaign. Uh, what is the role of the chair in supporting the candidates and, and how will you uh, better promote and support our endorsed candidates? Well, uh, Karen, if you're watching, uh, glad to answer that question. It's an important one. 
You know, the, the party does exist first and foremost to provide the leadership for the state to advance our policies, uh, to get our uh, people in office so that we can do the things we, we know we need to do to get our, our state back on, on track. And so my commitment uh, to everyone, um, the candidates and the activists and the people that are involved in the party, is that we're going to have a fair process. And we can have the internal debate. I like the internal debate personally. Um, we can have our endorsement uh, battles. We can have primary contests and the like. But after all of that, uh, from the party chair on down, we have to come together behind our endorsed candidates in the general election. Um, all of the internal activity of the Republican Party is not the end. Um, I like to tell people the party is a means to an end, and, and the real goal is to effect public policy in Minnesota, advance our state, better the lives of our people. And the only way we do that is when we get Republicans elected. So coming behind our endorsed candidates all the way through to the election in November is absolutely what we need to do. And uh, another question that, that was brought up was brought up uh, by Barbara Smith, and she lives in the 4th Congressional District as well. Uh, her question was, I want to know if and why you support moving the primary to June. If you can answer that, and then also, does the chair even have a role in, in right. enforcing right. that or changing that? Yeah, good question, Barbara, if you're out there watching. Uh, so the legislature sets the primary date. Uh, it used to be in September. They moved it to August because we had to have time for military and, and overseas, ab overseas absentee ballots to actually get counted. And so there's some discussion about whether we should pull the primary even earlier into June. Um, I actually do support that. I've always wondered a little bit uh, here in Minnesota why we kind of run against ourselves within the parties for literally six or nine months, and then we only run against our opponents of the other party uh, for a couple month period. So in my mind, it would make sense. Turnout in August in the last election uh, in that primary uh, was horrible. I think it was below 10%. So from a public standpoint, if moving it to June allows people to participate more, uh, I would support that. I actually think when people argue about, you know, how do you get Republican endorsed candidates elected, I think we have a better chance of getting them elected if we get them through the primaries in June as compared to having them uh, run against ourselves in August. And then you're only talking to Republicans and you aren't really talking to the middle and things. I think we're better off with a June primary. And, and the reason is, uh, for the public's sake and for the sake of, of getting Republican candidates elected in November, which is the real goal. Mm -hmm. And I talked to Bon Clayton earlier this week, and he had mentioned uh, something that the Republican Party of Minnesota used to have called the Century Club. And right. I don't think there's a, a Century Club anymore, but it essentially was $100 donors made up of uh, people on the grassroots, the grassroots activists. And how uh, can we restore the faith of the small donors because of the enormous debt that's out there. A lot of people are saying, well, I don't know if I want to donate 100 bucks or 200 bucks to the party because the debt is so high, I would rather just donate directly to the candidates. How would you address that objection? Uh, well, first of all, I actually uh, I agree with Bon on that point, and, and that's uh, part of an overall fundraising strategy, and that's to re-engage uh, the people who used to contribute to the party. Um, again, you're not going to do that until and unless people have confidence that the party is doing its job well, that there's controls on the money, that the money is being spent well, and it's kind of furthering our objectives. But it's not, that's not enough. Um, people who follow politics understand that right now, uh, financially, the money that drives campaigns and the vast majority of the images that they are going to see of the candidates in an election is not spent by the candidates and it's not spent by the political parties. It's spent by all of these other groups that are out there. And so the Republicans need to do a better job of bringing all of those groups who share a Republican perspective to coordinate what we're doing and actually deliver an effective campaign for our candidates. And then beyond that, all of the, the outside groups and making sure they work together, we have got to re-engage our major donor community, the small donor community. And again, having a plan to do that and giving people confidence that we're gonna be working a, an overall plan for the party uh, is absolutely key. You just can't right now go out and ask people to start giving money. They don't have the confidence in the party. Mm -hmm. One of the big issues, political issues out there uh, on a governmental level is spending. Uh, most people agree, and we actually had Representative Betty McCollum at a town hall admit for the first time that the federal government has a spending problem. Uh, one could make the argument that in the past 
the Republican Party of Minnesota has had a spending problem. And one of the ways perhaps to build credibility would be to find ways to reduce spending and to redu reduce cost. Do you have any specific ways that the party can reduce its, its overall spending and cost? Uh, I do. And, you know, you run the risk in a public forum on live TV like this, you know, kind of sharing your entire strategy with the world. And, and I want to be a little careful there. Uh, but since January, I've been building a business plan and a political plan for the party and reducing our cost structure and working more effectively with all of the outside groups to share in those costs is, is absolutely part of what we need to do. So I think people will be uh, favorably impressed um, if I'm the chair with what we do in the, the first couple weeks even to make sure that we address our cost structure. And uh, another question that uh, came out from Facebook was from a gentleman by the name of Bob Quashis and he lives in Marshall, Minnesota and he's been uh, intricately involved in uh, Hispanic Republican conservative outreach and he's very interested in, in that issue so his question is is if you're elected chair how would you propose uh, more outreach to minorities uh, and specifically within the Hispanic community right well on um, Bob and others who I think share the same interest you know the Republican Party as you think about the last election clearly needs to reach out to a broader uh, set of voters and having traveled the state again for the last few months, I remain convinced, I'm even more convinced, that the people of Minnesota, I think, run their lives and run their businesses consistent with Republican values. And so this idea um, that I continue to stress that we have to turn our attention outward as a party and as Republicans and get back in front of the people of Minnesota where they live and work in their business associations, their community associations, uh, their neighborhoods. We have got to get back out and meet with people, understand who they are, not just put a new brochure in front of them in September or October of 2014, but really engage with those communities so that it's not just a new marketing effort, it's not just a new rebranding campaign, it's us showing the people of Minnesota that we are on their side. Um, that's what it's going to take, and the minority community, other uh, uh, groups, coalition groups in, in Minnesota, all should be a focus and, and part of that. Mm -hmm. At the last state central meeting, uh, Chairman Shortridge mentioned that he wanted to instill a $70,000 a year salary for the party chair. I know the current deputy chair receives around $40,000 annually. Uh, what is your viewpoint? Are you going to take a, a salary? And on top of that, do you have a full-time job? Is that going to take away at all from your responsibilities as chair? And lastly, should the deputy chair receive a $40,000 a year salary? Right. Well, so first of all, I don't think uh, anybody at the state party should be getting a salary just for having a title behind their name. Uh, there's work to be done, and the work that is done should, should be compensated. Uh, personally, I've told people I think the challenge before us is substantial enough that as chair, I would go full-time on this, and I would take the salary, uh, but that's to actually do the work. And so the way I'm restructuring uh, the party organization and the job descriptions, uh, anybody that wants to take a salary is going to be doing real work uh, at the state party. Mm -hmm. And uh, do you have a, a preference in, in who you want to work with? Do you want to work with Kelly Fenton or do you want to work with Corey Sachs or can you work with both of them? Uh, yeah, I can work with both of them and I'd love to work with all of them. Uh, I have very intentionally in this campaign not created tickets, not run slates, not try to do this in a way that creates an us versus them or one part of the party, you know, kind of putting down and crushing the other side in order to win. Uh, I have tried to run this in a way where I've put my ideas out there. I have been myself. I have said the exact same thing to everybody. I have not cut a single political deal in order to try and win votes. We have got a job to do, and I've put a plan out there. I'm going to be releasing more details of that to the delegates and alternates. And if they like that plan and they like me, I'm hoping that everybody can come together behind that. And so I have very intentionally not tried to kind of forge alignments or uh, uh, create anything that would maybe accentuate some of the divisions in the party. In the contrary, I'd like to have us come united out of that convention and know that we're all moving together. Mm -hmm. Well, we're, uh, we're about out of time here, Keith. Yeah. Uh, thank you for coming on. And I'll give you the next uh, 30 seconds or so 
to talk about your website and, and any other messages you want you want to leave with. So sure. Well, thank you, Tony, and thanks everybody who's watching. Um, you know, it's a pivotal time. People have lost confidence in our institutions and, and politics broadly, and maybe Republicans specifically. And so we've got an important turnaround uh, here in Minnesota, and I'm confident uh, that our principles are right. The things that we advance from a policy standpoint are right. We have got to get back out in front of the people in Minnesota, and if we do that, I think we can have good success. Keith Downey, thank yeah, you so much for coming so on the show. And, uh, you're welcome anytime. So. All right, very good. Thank you. That was uh, Minnesota Republican Chair Candidate Keith Downey uh, from Edina on our show today. Uh, we're grateful to have him. We're going to be hearing from other candidates. And as you remember, we had Bill Paulson on and Corey Sachs on last week. We've extended invitations uh, to all the leadership candidates. And again, State Central is coming up. It's this Saturday, uh, April 6th. Uh, they're going to be voting. There's around 300 or so delegates there, and uh, they're all going to be voting about, upon who's going to be uh, the next chairman of the Republican Party of Minnesota. Uh, good times here. So I'm asking you all to bear with me. We, we're here on our first uh, studio for the first time, and uh, we're just trying to avoid as many technical difficulties as possible. So I'm going to bring on, uh, I'm going to play a pre recorded interview. Uh, that we did earlier this week with Mr. Bon Clayton. He's also chair candidate uh, for the Republican Party of Minnesota. And we shot this uh, in Edina uh, last Thursday, I believe it was. And uh, I'm going to see if I can get this playing. So uh, Dallas, uh, can we cue it up here? Hello, we're here on an off-site recording. I'm here with Mr. Bon Clayton. He is a candidate for the chair of the Minnesota Republican Party. So Bon, thank you so much for uh, coming in here, Tony. It's good to have you on the show. Yeah, yeah. I uh, wanted to talk to you about uh, why I'm running, and uh, uh, hopefully uh, many people can support me. Uh, number one, I'm the most experienced candidate. I'm the only one that's an insider with many years of experience as CD chair and BPOU chair. Uh, I've uh, been chair for many years of the Judicial District Chairs Republican Committees. Uh, which is all 10 of the judicial districts, and we coordinate our lobbying with the state legislature and uh, endorsing and electing of judicial candidates. Uh, I'm very much concerned about judicial accountability as state Republican chair. I will put together a method on the website for the Republican Party, which will uh, track where every legislate, Republican legislator stands on the issues so that their constituents can follow up with them and uh, tell them what for if necessary. Uh, the, the Republican Party is in a serious financial trouble. Uh, I, my pro program is to go back to neighbor to neighbor and century volunteer fundraising. Can you explain we, a little more what the Century right. is? Century is where we raise $100 from each person, have a major speaker like we've had Vice President Spiro Agnew and Governor Ronald Reagan in the, in the 70s. And uh, we raise a lot of money, millions of dollars, and it's decentralized. Currently our party fundraising for the, from the big givers and the small givers is completely centralized. And that's resulted in millions of dollars in the state budget and little or nothing for the grassroots BPOUs and CDs. So I want to flip that around and use the statewide fundraising efforts to pay off the debt and the grassroots to build up our ground game uh, where we'll be able to go head to head with the uh, grassroots efforts of the DFL, which was so successful in 2014. Uh, also, uh, Keith Downey uh, supports uh, the June primary. Uh, the other candidates, including me, do not. Uh, the reason for that is that the June primary would completely destroy our endorsement process. You need to have time between the endorsement and the primary for our endorsed candidates to get traction with the voters uh, so that they can win. And with the June primary, we'll just see lots of uh, people, rich people, <clears throat> uh, mainly moderates, who will uh, challenge our endorsed candidates and many of them will win. So those are my major arguments in favor of my being 
chairman. So can we talk about the debt a little more currently? The, right. the state party is, what is it, 1.6 million or so that's yeah. still owed. And I believe every single penny of that 1.6 million has to be paid back. So under your leadership, can you set forth uh, some goals that you have? Like after one year, what will the, the debt be? Well, I would think that uh, we can pay all of it off, although we're not required to. Uh, that's just a moral obligation that the party has taken on. I think it's a reasonable one. Uh, I've talked with one of the debtors, by the way, that's owned, owed, owed a lot of money, and he's, he says, give us a dollar a year and that'll be fine with us. So some of them are uh, malleable, people we can work with, but our goal is to pay it all off. I would say that a third to a half can be handled within the next year. Hmm. And with this additional fundraising that I'm talking about, the Century and Neighbor and Neighbor, we will have the sources of money to do that. Hmm. So I've asked all the candidates this question. Um, it was talked about at the last State Central meeting in December that the chair would get paid something around $70,000 a year. So could you talk about if you were elected chair, would you take a salary? Uh, how much and then also do you have any other commitments are you working full-time or do you have a business that would take away from your responsibilities as chair uh well i we have uh, my wife and i own and operate a cattle ranch uh and that takes some time but we have some people that'll help us with that too so that won't take too much time my my proposal is that i would spend half time now i don't know what the salary would be but in the past the state executive committee has negotiated with that with the chair. Uh, we would not have a paid executive director. We would not have a paid deputy chair. I haven't talked to the candidates for deputy chair about that. Uh, we would let a few other people go. We would have a lean and mean state office. We'd get out of the state, uh, out of the office that we're in now, which about is about three times as large as we need. Uh, and we'd put it in some inexpensive location. Our main goal there would be to find a place for our phone bank, our professional phone bank, where they'd be able to make phone calls without much trouble. But you can do that in lots of places. We can cut down on that statewide budget dramatically. So you talked about the, the deputy chair. We had one of the deputy candidate chair candidates on last week. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, currently the deputy chair gets paid, I believe it's $40,000 uh, per year. Uh, one of the justifications for that is the deputy chair needs to travel around the state and there's a lot of expenses. So in your opinion, does the deputy chair need to travel around the state of Minnesota or can you scale that position back a bit? Uh, we can cover expenses, but they don't need, it's just been a recent thing where they've been getting salaries. Uh, I think that's not necessary. They don't need to travel very much either. I mean, that's been a recent thing too. Uh, with Kelly, uh, she's needed to do a lot of work. Uh, her salary is justified because uh, Pat Shortridge is only in the office a couple days a week. And he's a volunteer. You can't mm -hmm. expect him. Yeah, we knew that day. going into it that yeah. he would be there. So that's a different situation. I, I have, like I say, I haven't talked to the deputy chair candidates, but we do not need them to be salaried. Mm -hmm. We need to be lean and mean, like I said. Mm -hmm. I'm a financial guy. I'm a graduate of the Harvard Business School. I've been uh, director of corporate uh, planning for the Green Giant Company, director of investment banking for the John G. Kennard Company, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So I know how to f manage financial things. Mm -hmm and we can cut way down on our statewide budget and use that money uh, that's freed up to pay off our debt. Mm -hmm. And uh, one last question before we, we give you 30 seconds to talk to the audience about uh, mm -hmm. why they should vote for you. Uh, there's been some things going around about, you mentioned that you're on the judicial committees and you've right. been involved in the issue. And then there was a, a recent lawsuit of, of I believe it was yeah. $1,500 or something. $1,200. $1,200 people were posted. Can you talk a little more about that lawsuit and, and what exactly that meant for people that don't know anything about it? Right. Well, the Judicial District Republican Chairs Committee had a website in which they uh, promoted recommendations for certain judges. And uh, the state party said, uh, you can't do that because you're not part of the state party. Well, in fact, you might have seen uh, Pat Shortridge's email that said that we are fictitious. We're not fictitious. We're in Article 12 and Article 5 of the state constitution. Everybody knows that. 
uh, Shortridge is a newcomer, so he didn't know that. Uh, so uh, the a panel of judges, or panel of attorneys, I should say, uh, ruled that we were not part of the Republican Party of Minnesota. Every, like I say, everybody in the party knows that. So we were fined uh, $1,200 and we're appealing that. Okay, and uh, Bon, thank you again for coming on and I'll just give you 30 seconds to a minute <clears throat> to talk to the audience and if you want to cover anything we didn't cover in this interview. Sure, well the, the main thing again is that I've got the experience. I've got the experience to raise money. I've got the experience to in, uh, endorse and uh, elect judicial candidates and other candidates. Uh, I've got the financial background to be able to get rid of our debt in a shorter time. And I plan to do that uh, with uh, uh, volunteer fundraising. And I'm uh, completely opposed to the June primary. Uh, this will destroy our endorsing process, which has served us well uh, for the last 55 years. Mr. Bon Clayton, thank you very much for coming on the show, Thanks and again, good Tony. luck with the race. Thank you. And we're back, and uh, that was Mr. Bon Clayton, pre-recorded interview from earlier this week. Uh, thank all the candidates for uh, coming on the show. Uh, next, we're going to bring on our final uh, candidate, Mr. Donald Allen. Um, Don, thanks for coming on the show. Hey, thanks for having me, Tony. Appreciate it. It's good to have you here. Yes. And, uh, you know, I actually went to the candidates forum, uh, what was that, last week, yeah, last Thursday? A couple Thursdays in, ago, in yes. In Congressional District 2, Bill yes. Youngbauer and yes. Mark Westerfall put that on. It, it was a great uh, forum. There was a lot of good information that was shared there. Uh, one of the moments that stood out to me is when you stood up and you told everybody that you would have, uh, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but you said you would have the debt paid off within the year or else you would resign. Exactly. And, and I did say that and I did mean that. You know, I, like I told you earlier, I was in uh, D.C. a couple of weeks ago and, and talked with several PACs down there that haven't had any contact with the uh, Minnesota GOP since 2008. And, then, and so on our outreach to business to business, uh, our political organization to political organization, we're not doing a good job. Uh, you know, there's more than a million Republicans in the state of Minnesota, and we haven't figured out how to get one dollar from each of them. You know, there's no reason to have a $1.6 million debt in a political organization that is expected to compete against the DFL candidates who are ingrained, funded well, well organized, and come after us with every chance they get. And they do a good job because we're losing consistently, you know, across the board. So it's, it's an opportunity to uh, reevaluate what we're doing at the state office, what we're doing uh, with the other outlying organizations, and to actually support them and gain, gain some credibility. Mm -hmm. So uh, to summarize then, your plan is outreach to the one million or so uh, self-identified Republicans out there and getting them to donate something? That's one third of the plan. Um, you know, has uh, my other earlier uh, uh, competitors that were here said, you know, I, I do have a plan. I don't want to hash it all out in public right at this particular point. But that's a third of, of one of the missions that we need to address. We also need to address uh, the angle of what is a Republican? What is the Republican Party? The core values are agreeable with everybody, okay? But yet it's how we position ourselves in the state of Minnesota, uh, not just in the Twin Cities, but in rural Minnesota across the state, you know, from toe to toe. And, how do we position ourselves? How do we get people to come in and join the Republican Party, support our candidates? Yeah, let's take the debt and set it to the side for a minute, okay? Let's just forget, if a debt wasn't there, we'd still have that same stigma or branding that people say, oh, Republican, you know, you can ask 10 people, are you Republican or Democrat? And nine out of 10 are gonna say Democrat. Okay, so what are we doing wrong in our messaging, in our branding, in our outreach, and where are the youth? You know, you've been to some of these conventions and you've looked around the room. There's some old money in there, but that money is not flowing into where it should be. So I wonder, you know, I went to a convention uh, a couple of weeks ago and I just looked around. And I says, OK, where are the college kids? Where are the 18 to 25 year olds? And we just they're not around. So I think that we have to look at our messaging and also uh, the brand that we seem to present mm -hmm. or don't seem to present at this point. Well, let's talk a little more about you. Why are you a Republican and have you been a Republican your entire life? Yeah, since I was 18, my father was a, a Republican and he talked to me. And back then, you know, in the 60s, the Republican Party was a lot different 
than it is now. And um, So you were living in Minnesota in the 60s? I was, I was born in St. Paul, okay, raised in nice. St. Paul. I'm from Minnesota. I'm a black American. Uh, you know, I, I, this is my home. Mm -hmm. uh, I was in the military, in the Army. Been across the world, all over the world. And uh, I was a Republican at the influence of actually my, uh, my father and my uncle. And so we, we, they talked about things. But also after they talked about things, they went to meetings. And they were not, you know, these Republicans in the 60s and early 70s were a different group of Republicans. Republicans for the state office showed up at these meetings uh, right off Rice Street and University in St. Paul at oh, yeah. the White Castle. Oh, yeah. And, okay. and there were Republicans elected back then, yeah, too. Yeah, all the time, you know. Mm -hmm. And they said, this is our agenda. This is what we're going to do. Uh, my, my dad was a contractor. And the houses on both sides of 94 between downtown St. Paul and Snelling Avenue, he built a lot of those houses. And so, I mean, he was politically active, donated, and says, you know, these people understand what a businessman does, okay? They understand what it is to be in business. Small business is the backbone of America. You support a Republican, you're supporting business, you're supporting your future. That was what my father would always tell me. So, fast forward to 2008, I was Barb Davis White's campaign manager. I decided, okay, I'm gonna jump back into this again. Barb called me up and says, yeah, let's do it. And I went to a uh, state, the, the state party office and was treated like an unwanted stepchild. I said, well, I need to talk to someone. I need to find out your procedures, what you do. And I mean, it was really, I don't understand how Republican candidates can even win with that kind of chaos going on in the state office. There's, there's no support there. And, and again, we're putting the $1.6 million to the side. Okay, I'm not talking about debt. This, even if there wasn't debt, the stigma is still there. We need to make sure that we vet our candidates, that we fund our candidates locally and throughout the state of Minnesota and make sure the small uh, BPOUs have some kind of purse that say we vetted this guy for city council or this girl for city council or for whatever and we can give them $500, let them start off, you know, because in the beginning campaigns are shady. There's not a lot of money there, you know, and so you're, you're taking it out of your own pocket, you know, out of your own family's fund and, and we want to make sure we push these uh, candidates to achieve the best they can ch achieve. Secondly, you want to make sure that GOP is sending out the right messaging. Okay, 2012, 2011, the first four years of Obama's uh, uh, presidency, we got emails attacking the status quo in Washington, D.C., and that President Obama was this, he was this, he was that. I'm saying, now wait a minute, wait a minute. We have great Republic Republican candidates running for office. Okay, why are we not focusing on fundraising, helping the Minnesota GOP get rid of its debt, and, and featuring these candidates? You can't compete. You're not New York. You're not Los Angeles. You're not Chicago. You're not Houston, Texas. You're not Miami. You're Minnesota. Let's concentrate here. Let's stay here in Minnesota. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's, that's my take on that. So you live, you, where do you live now? I live in Columbia Heights now. Columbia Heights. Yes. And is that a predominantly Democrat or Republican area? It's, it's a little bit of both. And the funny thing about Columbia Heights, everyone kind of gets along, both sides of the aisle out there, because you can have a conversation with a Democrat or with a Republican, and, you know, we kind of come to terms and agree on some things. But once you get into that Minneapolis city line, things just, you know, cross that line, things just really change. So I, I like the area that I'm in because I can have those conversations. I can be critical. I can talk about the DFL. They can talk about the Republican. And no one is lying because... I, I look at the DFL, I look how well they're organized. I look out, I get a knock at my door or a ring on my doorbell, and there's someone talking about the DFL. Okay, we don't have, we have a few people running this year, but we just want you to come to this voter education seminar we're putting on. We're going to have free food and daycare for your kid. I'm like, what? And I've never gotten a knock at my door for the Republican Party doing this. We need to start a nonprofit within the Republican Party that focuses on voter education. Again, our core, valuables are agree core, core values are agreeable with everyone. So why not get that out there? Why not use a 501c3 or a PAC to do that and to support local communities? Uh, people always ask me, are you running for chair to get more minorities into the party? I says, no. I says, but if you make the party attractive, with some uh, good, great advertising campaign, but you, you're, you're intentional about this for everybody, people will come. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, some of the great men in history, especially in African American history, were Republicans. You know, as far back as uh, W.E.B. Du Bois, Booker T. Washington, Frederick Martin Luther Douglas. King, Frederick Douglass, yeah. 
And, and so what happened? And, you know, I, I'm, I'm a scholar on uh, American history, especially African-American history uh, uh, and uh, psychology. So I always wonder, you know, what was the makeup that changed between the 60s when I was growing up and my father was a Republican to what happened like 1985 to 2008? Because there was a drastic change in that time period that we need to really examine because you can't go forward unless you know where you're coming from. Mm -hmm. And so I would hope that, you know, if I make it as chair, that I can get in and we can deal with some of those uh, philosophical issues within the party, but also raise money, support our candidates, support the Republicans in Minnesota, and win some races. Mm -hmm. Well, we're going to go to some of the questions that uh, some of the folks on Facebook and, and Twitter have for you. Uh, the first one, uh, I asked the same one. Are you going to take a salary? Yes. How much? Well, you know, here's what I was thinking. Uh, I looked at New York, Los Angeles, uh, Chicago, and, and some other cities where their chairs are, are doing 100 grand plus, including expenses, and you actually get a well-oiled machine. You get a functioning machine. You know, when you get what you pay for, you get a state uh, a chair who's in there two days a week. Uh, you get a state chair that doesn't really have to return calls. A state chair that can blow off things that, you know, well, because he can. You know, and, and the reasoning or the rationale is, well, I don't get paid for this. And, and I think that the deputy chair should be paid a handsome salary with expenses also because we're at the point in the Republican Party where it has to be almost rebranded and rebuilt. Mm -hmm. And so with that said, Yes, there, there needs to be salaries there. Okay. So going to the deputy chairs, do you prefer to work with Corey Sachs or Kelly Fenton? Well, I'm a people guy. And based on the history with the uh, current staff at the Minnesota GOP, we need a new set of eyes in there. And uh, a new set of eyes would really do well for the Minnesota GOP. And I, I don't, if uh, Ms. Fenton can have a new set of eyes, that's great. I know Corey has a new set of eyes, and he's ready to look in there. And, and part of that is the, your leadership ability and your ability to develop uh, the plan to move forward. And some of this, you know, there's some old guard stuff going on. And I just talk Frank and to the point because I've seen it. And I think Kelly or Corey could do a great job. Mm -hmm. you know, and I don't mind working with either of them, but I don't want the stigma of what happened way back when or the process from way back when to be, you know, like if you're a manager. I've been a manager going in a new business with a whole new staff. Three or four of that staff hate your guts and they don't even know you. And you have to deal with the first 30 days of kind of dealing with this individual who might lose their job at the end of the 30 days. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't want that to happen to anybody, but that stigma is, is within the state party right now that has to be addressed. Mm -hmm. Well, Don, uh, thanks for coming Thank on the you. show, and I'm going to give you uh, the last uh, 30 to 45 seconds if you want to talk about your website, any upcoming yeah. events, and, yeah. and talk to the delegates. Yes, I would. Uh, my name is Don Allen, and uh, you can just Google Don Allen, comma, Minnesota G MNGOP, and I come up all over the place. Uh, I really would like to be the chair of the Minnesota uh, Republican Party. I think it's an important piece. It, it signifies change. Uh, it challenges the status quo, and... I don't want the Republican Party to become extinct, and that is the direction that we are headed. Thank you. Don Allen, thank Thanks, you for sir. coming on the show. Thank you. Best of luck with Thanks. the race. Uh, that was all the Minnesota Republican Party chair candidates uh, that we had on. Uh, thank all of them uh, for running, for stepping up, and we'll see what happens. We'll report about what happens at State Central in the election coming up next Saturday. Uh, April 6th. And uh, we're going to be bringing on our East Coast correspondent now. Uh, hopefully we'll be able to uh, transmit our signal and be able to hear Mr. Samuel Wayne Pierce. Uh, he's going to talk a little more about, uh, he's going to talk a little more about um, uh, NCAA tournament and we're going to talk about Tubby Smith. We're going to talk about the University of Minnesota and, and some other things surrounding with that. So uh, Dallas, can we, uh, can we get Sam up on the screen here? There's Sam right there, and try to see if I can get on there. Sam, can you hear me, Hello, Sam? Min Hello, Minnesota. <laughs> Hello, New York. How's hey, everything hey. going in S Syracuse? Is it as beautiful there as it is in Minnesota? It's about, oh, 55 degrees and sunny right now here. We're loving it. It is. I, I, uh, I thought of you this morning. I had marathon training, and, and your viewers might not know this, but you, you successfully completed a marathon last year, so... I got up and, and did about seven or eight miles this morning. Nice. Beautiful. Just gorgeous weather and great way to start the day. So. You know, Sam, I got to say, hey. 
I got to say that you've been uh, an inspiration for me. I remember you talking to me way, way back before I decided to run the marathon. You were talking to me about running and, and how great it was ever since you started running. And, and I didn't believe that you could actually catch the running bug. Like my whole life, for the most part, I've really not liked running that much. But I run, I've run pretty much every single day outside this winter. You know, I run, you know, three, five, sometimes more miles. And and I absolutely love it. It's one of my favorite uh, parts of the day beyond spending time with my wife. So thanks for that encouragement. And you said you, you we were talking a little bit offline, a little bit about the University of Minnesota and the whole uh, Tubby Smith. Uh, for people that don't know, the head coach of the Gophers, uh, Tubby Smith, was um, he was let go. And uh, that's come with some contractual obligations and whatnot. Can you talk a little more about that, Sam? Yeah, I want, I want to give you uh, a few tidbits today. I, I was hoping we could do the good, the bad, and the ugly of the tournament. And uh, that, unfortunately, is going to be the ugly. So let me hit on the good and the bad and then come back to Tubby. Is that okay? That's fine, yeah. Okay, so the good. <laughs> um, I, I need to mention Syracuse, my home city. They knocked off number one seed Indiana on Thursday night. And they're actually playing Marquette in a game to get to the Final Four right now that President Obama is uh, taking in since the game is in Washington, D.C. So I thought that was interesting. Uh, if your viewers got a chance to watch Michigan and Kansas last night, that went to overtime, the only tournament game this year to go to overtime thus far. Tremendous game. Michigan came back, beat Kansas, something you, Tony Hernandez, predicted in your bracket. And uh, as long as we're talking about the good with this tournament, we should mention your bracket. You, you, you predicted accurately six of the Elite Eight teams that are playing today and tomorrow to wow. get to the Final Four. And then three of the final four teams you predicted are alive, uh, nice. as your your national championship prediction, Ohio State. So that one, I, I'm I'm not feeling so confident that Ohio State's going to be able to to slam dunk the championship through. What do you think? The the only real underdog team left is Wichita State, and Ohio State gets them tomorrow. So Ohio State arguably has the easiest of the Elite Eight games to get to the Final Four because Wichita State is a nine seed, and that they'll be. They'll be an underdog to, or and actually, I apologize. That game's tonight. Uh, mm -hmm. Ohio State and Wichita State. So, I, I think you're in good shape. I think you did a great bracket, and I, I'm proud of you. Well, I know uh, in our office pool, it's between me and and one other guy, and it totally depends on. Wait, did Mich you said Michigan played already, or last night they came back from down and beat. Kansas. See, that was my big win right there, right? It was. It, it was huge. You you had it predicted that Michigan would beat Kansas in that game, and and then. Uh, Michigan plays Florida the next, and you. I'm looking at your bracket, and you have Michigan beating Florida tomorrow. If that happens, you're in really good shape. Let's so, go Michigan then. So the, so the good is, uh, is is a great tournament, and and the Tony Hernandez bracket. I wanted to mention uh, you, you've run for office a couple times, and if you if you do that again and it doesn't work out, you you could go to work for ESPN maybe as an analyst. I mean, you got the coaching experience, and and you're and you're quite. Uh, good at, at predicting these these brackets. So I think uh, I think you'd be pretty good too, Wayne. <laughs> well, um, so so that's the good. The bad, uh, and I maybe should say the sad, is that Florida Gulf Coast University got eliminated last night. Florida Gulf Coast University didn't even have a basketball program 15 years ago. We talked about them knocking off Georgetown a week ago, and then the following day they won again. So this tiny program advanced to the Sweet 16 and kind of became. An America, a de, a de facto America's team for people that either their school had been eliminated or maybe they didn't have a, a passionate following. They were a casual fan. It was fun to, to watch this small underdog school make that kind of a run, and they they were historic in that they were the lowest seed to ever advance to the Sweet 16. So, mm -hmm. so that was the bad or the sad that they got eliminated last night. Uh, less and less underdogs, more favorites surviving now, which is fine. Um, but. Uh, so that's a little bit about the good and the bad. The ugly, uh, I think, is the firing of Tubby Smith earlier this week. So uh, Minnesota had a uh, had a decent season in the most competitive conference, the Big Ten, in the country. Uh, they won some good games. They were up and down a little bit, but then they get to the tournament. Uh, they win their first game. They just they just crushed UCLA. And then they went up against a real good Florida team and lost in the second round. This was Tubby Smith's best year at Minnesota as far as advancing into the tournament. Tubby Smith, in six years, 
won 61% of his games, and he got Minnesota invited to the NCAA tournament three times, or 50%. In the eight years preceding Tubby, Minnesota went once. Once in eight years, and then Tubby got him there three out of six. Mm -hmm. Uh, Won a lot more games than Minnesota had been previously winning. And to to the coaching staff and the university in those eight years preceding Tubby, we need to be fair and we need to talk about what happened at Minnesota in the late 90s. They were coached by a, by a fellow named Clem Haskins. and mm-hmm. uh, He was a good coach, early. by the way. Well, um, <laughs> maybe, <laughs> but he was uh, authorizing payment, illegal payments to players. Uh, he, he had to come out and admit that he had paid other students to do papers and homework for players. There were some sexual misconduct allegations against some of his players that he kind of had swept oh, yeah. under the rug. I mean, it, it was a, a dirty program. They actually went to the Final Four with Bobby Jackson back in 97. They had to vacate that. Do you know, Tony, that uh, according to the NCAA, from 1993 to 1999, Minnesota's official record is zero wins, zero losses. They vacated everything. Like, it just didn't exist because the program was in such bad shape. Hmm. So to Coach Monson, who came on after that and had the unenviable task of rebuilding a program uh, in spite of all of the you know loss of scholarship and sanctions against them, that was difficult. So we don't want to fault him too much for that. But eventually they decide Minnesota decides to go the route of Tubby Smith. And he, he, he took them from, from nowhere to, to a consistent middle of the road contender in a very difficult conference. Um, more importantly, he's the kind of guy that I think if you had a son going to, to play college basketball, if you, if you were that fortunate, he's the kind of coach you would want your son to go play for. He's a stand-up guy. So I think we need to assess what amateur athletics mean and just how good is good enough with, with, with winning versus, um, versus having a reputable guy running your program. Yeah. So that's, that, that's number one, but then... More importantly for your show and your audience, what struck me was that this new athletic director comes into Minnesota, and here's some background. So he comes in, and a year ago, he says he renegotiates Tubby Smith's contract. Tubby Smith's buyout was a million, $1.5 million. The new athletic director renegotiates it, and Tubby Smith walks away with a $2.5 million buyout, and now a year later, the same AD says, you're out of here after... They have their best season in who knows how long. That's uh, that's that's unbelievable, and it's not actually that shocking. Uh, I love the University of Minnesota. I love Gopher Athletics, but it's just in terms of their fiscal responsibility. I mean, there was an article that came out here, Sam, about the Gopher, uh, the TCF Bank Stadium. It's where the Minnesota Gophers play football, and for the first year, the Minnesota legislator uh, allowed them to sell beer at the stadium. This is in the heart of the, of the University of Minnesota campus. Uh, they earned $900,000 in revenues and beer sales, but at the end of the day, the college actually lost money. They lost uh, like $16,000 in beer sales. And as somebody who's interested in entrepreneurial uh, activities and business and whatnot, uh, we can find the businessman in Minnesota that can turn a profit for beer sales at an NCAA football game, I have no doubts about that. And it, what did you say? One point five million is, is the kind. No, it, no, it was one point five, and the new the new AD in his infinite wisdom renegotiated and let Tubby get up to a two point five wow. million dollar buyout. And now Kansas, so the the guy that's responsible for giving him a bigger buyout, a year later says you're out of here after they've had their best season in. Decades. Unbelievable. Really? Unbelievable, Sam. Well, thank you for uh, that report out of, out of Syracuse. i got to bring on uh, Jake Duesenberg. We're going to talk about uh, some economics here. But Sam Wayne Pierce out of Syracuse, New York, he'll be back again uh, next week. So uh, I'm going to bring on Jake uh, Duesenberg, frequent uh, guest and, and expert on the show. Jake, it's good to have you here, and, and you're looking great today, by the well, way. Thank you very much, Tony. Suit jacket, Ty, is it because we had the uh, Republican candidates here? Or, or? Well, I guess I was dressed up for them. You called me this morning, don't you remember this, and you said, you know what, I'm wearing a suit and ties, so 
I said, oh, I, I can't be outdressed by Tony on his own show. You got the, you got the memo again, too. <laughs> what do you think of uh, the new set and everything? Do you like how oh, it Oh, I works? love it here. This is great. This looks really nice. Uh, it's, it's comfortable, and uh, I think we'll get some good work done yeah, here. Yeah, yeah. We had some t technical difficulties at the beginning, uh, but, you know, it's just the first time at the studio, and... Dallas it's a, a one-man show. I mean, there's only one guy right now back there doing it. He is doing a fantastic I job. I know. Super Dallas yeah. back there. He, he's figuring things out fast. And we got Andrea, too, who works here yep. at SCC TV, who's helping with uh, any emergency situations. So right. we're grateful for uh, Andrea, too. Yeah. But uh, so you, what do you want to talk about here? I know we talked about Cyprus last week, and a lot has happened in Cyprus. The right, yeah. Parliament or, or actually passed the... A tax on people's bank accounts and couldn't believe it. I think 10% is what actually went through or something close to that. And right. boom, gone. Punishing the savers once again. Isn't that uh, what modern economics is all about? Punish the savers? And Well, I, 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 I got a little different take than I think the main financial media. And as long as I'm talking, I, I brought those slides in. And I know you're controlling on that wonderful Mac computer you've got. Um, the financial media wants to make it sound like punishing the savers is a bad thing, but really, in my opinion, when you put money in an investment or you put it in savings, you are the bearer of that risk. And um, there seems to be a moral hazard in European Union and both in here in America. We we uh, make sure that by the government uh, it, we de we ensure deposits. Um, in fact, one of the first things Tony we did after our financial crisis in 2007 mm -hmm. was we up the uh, FDIC insurance yep. to $250,000, it used to be $100,000. So a small depositor like myself goes to bank and I don't really care what the bank's doing with my money. Uh, if they're loaning out to, uh, let's say in the case of Cyprus to uh, Greece and their, their bonds, I don't really care because my money seems to be safe. So that's essentially what happened in Cyprus. Well, what the last thing that I've heard coming on Cyprus is anyone under 100 euros, which is what that insurance policy is, is uh, safe. There's no taxation or uh, confiscation of their deposits. But the people over 100 euros are actually going to be, and I've seen multiple reports, I think even up to 60% is at stake here. But once again, like I mentioned last week, it's better that those people take that risk. They never had the promise of insurance on any deposits over 100 euros. So it's better that they take the risk than either the, the Cyprus taxpayers, and let's say one is investing in gold or one's investing in the U.S. stock market with their money, there's no reason they should be taking the burden for that. Or even worse, since this is the Eurozone, someone over in Germany or uh, you know uh, Ireland has to pay for what's going on in Cyprus. So I actually think that the um, depositors, the people that put their money in that bank, that was actually going out and making depo or, uh, buying up Greek bonds should be taking that risk. Hmm. So uh, I'm looking here on our uh, trusty little Mac computer. What is it exactly that you we'll want to go into open your up? Tony show here? Let's see. And this is you part of the, talk a little bit. Yeah, about this is part of that new studio. Uh, and I think the audience doesn't care if we look a little unprofessional for a second, so we can get these yep. wonderful charts that I, I created for the show. Um, but uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you actually what happened this week. Cyprus led those headlines all through Thursday, and then all of a sudden something happened in America that stole the financial headlines. The S&P 500, which is a broad index of 500 of the biggest companies in America, hit an all-time record high. And uh, so that stole the headlines, and then it actually closed even higher on Friday. So we're in new record territory with the mm -hmm. S&P 500. So you want me to pull up uh, this graph right yep. here? Uh, go ahead and pull up, uh, is that the 30, uh, 30 March? 30 March, There yep. you go. All right, good. so uh, where the heck is it? Talk a little more. It's a and, and you know, that first slide will show you, I'm going to show you a graph here with the S&P 500 um, that uh, shows the last 10 years, so the last decade, mm -hmm. a performance of, uh, when, I, when I say the S&P 500, I'll sometimes use the stock market. I'll, I'll use those two terms synonymously because, uh, generally speaking, it's the broad uh, measure of how the stock market in the United States is doing mm -hmm. uh, with the 500 biggest companies. Mm -hmm. Um, so, what do uh, I put it in the slide sorter oh, here? Uh, just, just go do a, f a view. A uh, there. There you go. And if you go to um, Dallas, um, you want to pop this up. All right. There we go. And if you go on the bottom screen here, I think oh, that if thing? you do the full screen showing, um, we'll be able to see that a little bit better. No, we're not. We're not. We're not, just talk about we're it? not Mac experts, are we? <laughs> I just actually got my first Mac the other day. 
and uh, I think I'm part of the contributions to Dell's poor performance because it was really an option between uh, Dell or Mac and I or Apple, and I went with uh, I went with uh, Apple product. Um, well, while you're working on that, you can see this chart is the last decade here of uh, of the S&P 500's performance. What I did is I took the uh, show you the record there with that red arrow uh -huh. of its uh, largest uh, or its previous record close, which came in an Octo October of 2007. And uh, and then uh, after that, we had the uh, the financial meltdown here with the housing market, which ended up going. Oh, there's a better look of it. There we go. Uh, went into the uh, stock market, so we took a significant drop in the stock market at that point, and we just uh, had climbed up here in the last uh, many years, and finally got to record high. Now this is the big story in the financial headlines, and and, and rightly so. But what I don't think is I don't think it tells the right story. Um, I'm not saying that this is not a good, good thing to talk about, but there's a caveat to it. If you go to the next slide, what's happened here in the United States, I'm showing the Federal Reserve uh, credit to uh, banks. You see at that same point when the stock market had gone down that previous slide, we had increased the uh, ca cash or the credit to banks in the United States, and we ended up getting into the uh, bond buying markets in the U.S. and, and mortgage-backed securities. And so there's been an influx of cash, uh, or credit, I should say, into the banking system. And what I say is that creates upward pressure on large items like uh, commodity items and areas where the government's spending money. So if you go to the next slide and we look back at that S&P 500 and we measure that in an ounce of gold, we uh -huh. see a completely different chart. You're now looking at... Uh, what used to buy in October 2007, so the previous high uh, uh, in terms of dollars, would buy you two ounces of gold. Today, the S&P 500, even though in dollars it's higher than October 2007, only buys you one ounce of gold. So in relation to gold, we haven't uh, actually reached the high. In fact, we're uh, kind of on a 10-year low. Um, if you go to the next slide, not a lot of people that I come across in just you know average investors like to talk about <laughs> Uh, things in relation to gold because not a lot of people are comfortable talking that way. So what uh, I like to do is bring it down to something that we all understand. I use gasoline because we all fill up our tank of gas. And here's a different chart once again. If we measure where the S&P 500 is in gasoline, and in layman's terms that means if you were to cash out your stock portfolio today, how many gallons of gasoline could you buy? Well, that's only 432, whereas in October 2007, the previous close, was at 542 gallons. So once again, we haven't reached the high in gallons of gasoline. And if, you, if you're an average driver of 15,000 miles a year, and, you know, and you're driving your 20 mile a gallon vehicle, you're only buying, uh, you're buying, that's basically like two months of gasoline that you're, you're out. So what you're showing here is that the S&P and, and the Dow Jones, I, I think the S&P just hit its all time record high. Uh, was it last week? In dollar bills, yeah. In, in in dollar bills, but yep. what you're saying is is that's essentially it doesn't mean much because when you adjust it for inflation, right? Uh, either measured on on gasoline or uh, gold, the value of those two commodities, then what you see is actually you still see a fluctuation, right? In up and down, and just judging off of this graph that I see here, we're, we're pretty much we're pretty much at a, a mean level right now. We're actually not at a market high. I exactly. So. And this is what's really important because what is what is cash? I mean, what are, what are dollar bills? If you price something in dollar bills, that's just really what money is. And this is a little less than money. Is money is a commodity that's equally exchanged during trade. And uh, what we're saying here is that the, the unit of trade, the U.S. dollar, isn't buying as much gold, or it's not buying as much gallons of gasoline. Now, gold's hard to understand for people because other than jewelry, we don't have a lot of use for it. But gallons of gasoline, that's an easy way for us to understand that hey, my stock portfolio isn't buying me as much gas, gallons of gasoline, and I use that thing on a daily basis. And I don't have a chart, but I could show you the same thing if we look at a broad basket of uh, commodities, especially of uh, agricultural goods, so you know, beef or uh, uh, wheat or corn and stuff like that. In fact, my financial firm is just starting to do our own inflation tracking, and it's available to people that I do business with, and we'll probably release some figures to the public, but it'll actually break down a person's budget and a typical family's budget and say what your 
price inflation is on a, on a quarterly basis. Great. Are you going to be uh, Are you going to be joining us on the on the show next? We'll week? have to figure that out. I'll be at the state central committee voting for one of these uh, gentlemen. So nice. Well, Jake, thanks for uh, sharing thanks the, for uh, me, the information. And this is uh, the first episode of the Tony Hernandez Show at our new studio here at SCC Television Studios in White Bear Lake, Minnesota. We broadcast live every Saturday from 4 o'clock to 5 o'clock, and then we replay our show on Tony Hernandez Show. That's the name of our YouTube channel. Thank you to all of our viewing audience out there. Thank you for continuing to stick with us. God bless America. God bless your week. Happy Easter, and vaya con Dios. I like her new music better.